All right, this is a video response to Ian Juby on his episode of Genesis Week called DNA Double Double. I'll put a link down below. You can watch the whole thing yourself. I'm just going to concentrate on one part because as we all learned from, uh, you know, my former attempts at addressing a Juby video, I'm incapable of doing more than one point per video. Um, so, uh, well, uh, first I'll let Ian introduce his segment. The title of the press release helps the layperson understand both the discovery and its significance. Scientists discover double meaning in genetic code. Okay, so, um, first of all, I've talked about this before in regard to Ian, um, and if you happen to catch this video, I doubt you will. Please take this to heart, and I mean this with the most utmost respect. Um, when you want to know what an article, a, a, an actual primary literature article, article is about, um, consult the actual article, okay? That UW press release um, has been slammed by people that actually work in genetics. They got the science wrong, they got the results wrong of what the scientists found. It's terrible, okay? And I understand, now I have this article here. This is the, uh, this Tergakis et al. paper from Science. Um, and I'm gonna, you know, there's no shame in not understanding this paper, okay? It's pretty tough stuff. I've taken, I've taken graduate level genetics classes. I've taken graduate level physiology and biochemistry courses. Um, and I still had to look up a few points from this paper. It's pretty, pretty hard stuff. But, and I've pointed this out to Ian before, so again, if you're watching, almost every time uh, science, nature, um, cellular molecular development, these journals, when they have an article that may be above the heads of scientists not in the field of what the article's about, um, they have these perspectives. Uh, basically, their science editors write a summary of it. This is what you should have consulted before, um, rather than that UW paper or uh, while listening to what Klinghoffer had to say about it, because, God, well, that's, I, I don't have the highest respect for Klinghoffer um, anyway, but that's, that's an aside. So, anyway, so why don't you uh, continue on and tell us what you think this paper was about. Now, when proteins are made, the DNA is read three bases at a time. These groups of three are called codons. What the researchers discovered was that the codon could act as one of the instructions on how to build a protein, but also simultaneously, the codon would also act as one step in an instruction on how to control genes. Um, Ian, no. I don't know how you could be more wrong. Well, okay, I guess you could be a lot more wrong. Your some of the details are more. They're in the they're in the same room as accurate. Um, but again, you're over. You're 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 really exaggerating uh, the significance of this. And I'm not. I'm not demeaning the paper or the study. The it's a perfectly, it's a great study, it was great information, we learned a lot. Okay, now, like, as Ian explained, okay, three nucleotides make up a codon. The codon makes an amino acid, okay? Um, it's, it's transfer RNA, well, uh, the, the, the DNA codes for transfer RNA, which then will make start constructing a protein, okay, the process of constructing a protein. Now, this is going to be really, really simple, part of, partially because bits of it are, are out of my specialty. In fact, lots of it's out of my specialty. Um, and I'm also trying to make it simple, and so I'm just getting at the gist of it. So if you genetics majors out there, actual genetics majors, um, you're going you're gonna to cringe, I'm sure, at some of my misuse of phrasing and things like that. I So... I do apologize in advance. So anyway, three nucleotides make a codon. But what was, what's been found since we've been sequencing DNA, now that we're able to do, you know, sequence entire genomes, is we find that 
we found that uh, the, the three nucleotides, sometimes different, different sequence of nucleotides will make the same amino acid and therefore an identical protein. So, for example, is it, is it AAC and AAT both make asparagine? So, it doesn't matter which one is present in a nucleotide sequence, asparagine will be made. And so, if that is then made into a, transcribed into a protein, that protein will have asparagine. It will be identical to a protein made with a AAC or AAT, right? However, one of the things that, that science looks for is we look for thing, bias in things, okay? If, if it's completely identical and there's absolutely no difference, then both of those, AAC and AAT, should exist in identical numbers, meaning it shouldn't matter. It does, you know, there's no selection, there's nothing, there's nothing, no advantage to having one or the other. And there's a number of different things that have been discovered that cause the fact that there is a, I mean, that explain that there is a bias. In fact, there's usually a pretty strong bias. Um, with that one, with asparagine, it's not that strong, strong. Um, it's 52 versus 48 percent. Um, meaning there's a 52 percent preference for, I forget which one of them is it, AAC. I think it's AAC. Um, other, other ones, where they're almost entirely use one codon sequence, even though another one would make an identical, an identical product. And so, again, there's a whole bunch of, you know, scientists will do some research, they'll find a thing, they'll say, wow, we've accounted for 5% of this bias. Not all of it, we found it, you know, so there's 5% of it taken care of, but what about the other 95%? Then somebody else does a different study and go, we found this feature in the genome that explains another 17% of it. These researchers found 15%. Okay, first of all, that's really an important number here. 15% um, of, of these genes have a codon sequence, they call a duon, because it also is a binding site for a transcription factor, okay? Meaning it says transcription factors come along, bind to the DNA, and start basically the process of manufacturing a protein through the, through the RNA. Um, so they bind, they start the process off. Where do they bind? They don't just bind randomly. They bind at these binding sites. So if a particular codon is also a binding site, then the transcription factor will preferentially bind there as opposed to a codon sequence that may make an identical protein that doesn't have a binding site there. Does that make sense? Um, that's what it is. It's cool. It's neat. It's nifty. It's another couple of bricks of information in our knowledge of how these regulatory factors work. <sighs> okay, get, get to your analogy. Let me make an analogy. We have a complex computer system which reads instructions provided to the computer. The computer follows the instructions to control machinery which makes metal parts for a robot, gears for example. The instructions are written in the common programming language known as machine code. Now envision that the computer also uses those exact same instructions and instead the computer is told to read the instructions as FORTRAN programming code. The computer is able to read instructions on how to build the robot using the parts it is making with the instructions for both the manufacturing and assembly of the parts embedded in the same words. The person who wrote out those instructions would be beyond a super genius. Programming in two different computer languages at the same time. Okay. Now, that's what I'm, ta that's what I'm talking about. H how is it, how is it, like, building components for a robot and then instructions to put the com robot together in two different computer languages? You're talking about the language, if you want to call it that, of DNA, and you're talking about, by language, you mean something that simply says bind here. Okay, that's what a transcription, that's what a binding site for a transcription factor is. It just says bind here. Okay, I, I don't understand how that, I mean, it's important. I'm not saying it's not important. Okay, but I don't, I, your analogy is 
way over exaggerating, and I don't think you got that yourself. I don't think you got that from reading these papers. I think you got it from Klinghoffer's really bad summary uh, distortion, I'd go so far as to say, or the really, really crappy article in the UW press release, um, not reading the original paper. Now, um, you also make these two, or you borrow these two analogies. As David Klinghoffer put it on Evolution News and Views, genome uses two languages simultaneously. Try that yourself sometime, why don't you? Indeed, imagine a person speaking both Russian and English at the same time. Another analogy would be a book in which the same sentence could, sentences could be read either in English or in Portuguese. Okay, I have a better analogy that I think yeah, it's not accurate. Analogies can't be entirely accurate, and unfortunately in the creation movement they like to use these... They like to take an analogy and then do all kinds of really bizarre twists with it, but that's, that's an aside. Um, I have one of these uh, talky, texty devices. Uh, I forget what they're called. Um, I resisted getting one. I, I despise... I don't like that talky device that's attached to the wall of my house um, because it goes ring, ring, and I have to talk to somebody and it pisses me off generally. I don't like to, you know... I like to talk to people face to face. I'm not much of a phone person in general. Um, and so the idea of having one of these things, like like a ball and chain around my ankle, kind of was, was wasn't necessarily something I was really keen on. But work required it. Um, so I have one. And, see has a little keypad, a tiny little itty bitty keyboard, and I can I can text, so I can there and I can text away. I can I can talk to fishermen, I can talk to researchers that are doing stuff, um, getting together for meetings and all this kind of thing. So it's got its uses and I've kind of gotten used to having it. One of the things though that I discovered is that when I text a sentence like the cod are migrating south I don't know why I would say that, but maybe I, maybe I would have some reason for saying cod are migrating south. And I type that in, and I end it with a period. Now, that period has meaning, right? It tells the person receiving my text, hey, that sentence is finished, full stop, right? But I discovered, quite by accident, that when I start the next sentence, the first letter of the next sentence is automatically capitalized. So that period both has the information saying end of sentence, but it also tells the little program inside of this machine to act as a shift key. Therefore, I don't get my thumb all sore reaching over to hit that shift key, right? You know? You see how that works? It's a pretty neat little device. It also does it with the, uh, the, um, the question mark. But it doesn't do it with an exclamation point. So, Let's just say in some world where I'm a, a texting maniac, I'm by no means a texting maniac, I, again, I still don't particularly care for it, but let's just say in this world, I'm typing away all the time, and I hate bending my thumb way over to get that shift key because it's so far away. I mean, it's, it's like, what, almost a centimeter away from where most of my typing occurs. Um, well, I guess it could be as far as like seven centimeters away, see? So I have to stretch way over and hit that. So, in order to avoid doing that, I'm going to start preferentially using sentences that end with a period or a question mark and avoid those with an exclamation point, you see? That way I don't get, you know, you see how that would work? So, that is basically, that is an example, an analogy of what the researchers found. They found that some codon sequences also have the right arrangement to attach for a transcription factor to it, for a transcription factor binding site. So therefore, they're transcribed more often than an identical sequence, well, they, oh, sorry, an, a, a sequence for an identical protein that doesn't have that binding site. Okay, do you see how that works? So if you've got one sequence that has a transcription factor binding site, one that doesn't, which one's going to make more product? Which one is going to be producing more, utilized more often, more under selective pressure, right? You see how that works? Um, 
if the one that doesn't have that sequence gets a bug in it, doesn't work anymore, becomes a pseudogene, it's not a big deal because you've got the one that has that correct, you have, that has that binding factor. The organism may not notice, and I don't mean that in a, like, consciously recognize one of your binding, or one of your uh, codon sequences isn't working. Okay? Does that follow through? I mean, I think that makes sense. This is not speaking Russian and, and English at the same time, or reading a book in English and Portuguese at the same time, okay? This is reading English where the period has two different meanings, okay? And it's neat, and I'm not demeaning the researcher's work. This is great stuff. Um, we've now explained 15% more of this, this codon bias, okay? Still leaves a lot to explain, but we've explained a lot more of it. This is cool. Science progresses. And I'm going to say, this is what irritates me about the Disco Toot, Casey Luskin, Klinghoffer, uh, Myers. These guys, um, as somebody, I, I, I forget who put it on a, on a discussion board, they don't do science. They're parasites on science. They comb the, the primary literature. They look for this kind of stuff and they go, hmm, let's see, how can we make this sound like God did it? Designer did it, I'm sorry. Okay? They go, oh, look at this. You know, and then they go, well, this codon, this codon choice, well, then that's kind of like two different languages. Well, that's kind of like two different computer programs working simultaneously. That's kind of like speaking English and Portuguese at the same time. How could this happen? There's no possible way it could evolve. And and I'm going to end with that, except i got one more point to make. Um, Ian, you mentioned that the problem for breakage in the system is is greater. You know, if one thing is, if there's one error, one nucleotide is different, it's not just going to affect the protein, it's going to infect the instructions for that protein, And you know, using your analogy. Um, it'd be like having a book that reads in English and Portuguese, you change one of the letters randomly, it no longer is in English or Portuguese anymore, right? So that would make sense. But you, you overlooked something that's really important. If that were true, if your analogy was reasonably valid, you, me, my cat, walk around with dozens, if not hundreds of point mutations, ones that your parent, you didn't inherit from your parents, ones you accumulated during your life. If all of our genes were so critically coded with this double information, we wouldn't be able to survive that. And we survive it quite well. Now, it's not that it's harmless. I'm sure it causes a lot of problems, um, whether or not you call it entering a sin into the world or whatever you want to, whatever cause you may attribute to it. The point is, is that it wouldn't exist, or or we wouldn't exist, if the system was as you described. Um, so anyway, all right, guys, take care. Uh, I'll put a link down below uh, to these articles, and I hope everybody has a good night.